This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated in Christ Jesus, in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive, as I'm taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better, and I'll never be the same again. Amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. We are finishing up our series from Joshua. And we have spent a few weeks here from Joshua chapter 1 into Joshua chapter 7. And the message this morning, vision is destiny. And we have been saying all along that if what God told Joshua is true, then the real way to be blessed, healthy, and prosperous is to make our lives pleasing to God. If that's the case, there are really only two things that matter. What has God said about our lives? And what are we saying and doing about what God has said? Now, in this series, we're, we, are, we have called it Covenant and Character because I have seen over these years, I've seen people who had good character, but they never took action to walk in covenant with God and it hindered them. And then I've seen people who took action to walk in covenant with God, but a lack of character tripped them up along the way. So in this ministry, and you have to understand that this ministry is unified. In other words, we're doing the same thing at St. Paul's. We're doing the same thing in the youth ministry. We're doing the same thing in the children's church ministry because it's not just a matter of teaching the Word of God and teaching faith. We're teaching character because we can tithe. We can walk in covenant, but if we lie and cheat and steal at work, it's going to catch up to us. Can you say amen? And, or if we're not diligent, or if we're late all the time, everywhere we go. In other words, it's not just covenant, it's also character. Now the problem, of course, I understand, I think in a week or 10 days, I'm going to be 58. So let me go ahead and say in my 58 years, uh, <clears throat> it seems like there has been a moving away from personal responsibility. And now we have a generation out there and they want to drop out of school and they want to have children before they get married and uh, they want the same stuff as somebody who stayed in school. And they feel like they deserve the same stuff as somebody who goes to work every day even if they don't go to work every day. So we live in this culture, this generation of something for nothing. And it's crept into the church. Because now some of the biggest evangelical, so-called evangelical churches, I don't know that they're evangelical really, but some of the largest evangelical churches in the world are teaching that it doesn't matter how you live. Well, we spent several months on Wednesday night <clears throat> talking about from the book of James that our lives ought to be a reflection of our conversion. Well, here a few months back, we spent months in the book of first John we see the same thing there so if we're born again it ought to show up in our conduct see the Bible teaches that without vision God's people perish and some people have a vision for their own failure while some envision the best that God has for them life prosperity and honor so what we envision for our own lives is a matter of life and death it's a matter of success or failure. Why? Because vision is destiny, and that's the title this morning. Vision is destiny. And I realize that I'm a product of my generation. I realize that I'm a product of what was fed to me. We are, I remember Kenneth Hagin saying that anointing comes by uh, environment. The anointing comes by the Word of God, but it comes by environment. Environment, everybody say environment. And that's why coming to a church like this is so important, not just for you, but for your children. And so when I started selling cookware at age 18, I guess it was, uh, to pay my way through Bible school, the owner of the company started feeding me Zig Ziglar tapes, 
Napoleon Hill books, a book by W. Clement Stone. And so this is how I came up, that if I wanted a better tomorrow, I had to take action today. If I wanted to reap a harvest tomorrow, I had to sow seed today. I had to take action to make a better tomorrow for myself. And in the way I came up, nobody was going to do it for me. I mean, the thought never occurred to me. So I graduated from college when I was 20. I got married when I was 20. I went over here to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and I enrolled in their Master Divinity program when I was 20. And uh, they had a, a display table there for health insurance, and I th the thought had never occurred to me because I'd always been on my father's policy. I thought, oh my God, I'm married. I guess I better get us some health insurance. The thought never occurred to me that I ought to go get our groceries from somebody else and I ought to go get our health insurance from somebody else and I ought to go get a living from somebody else. The thought never occurred to me. Well, this same thinking of something for nothing that is out in the culture is creeping in to churches. And what it does, it sabotages people. God has a plan for your life. Say it out loud. God has a plan for my life. In the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at this poor sucker, and that's exactly the way I look at him, you know, poor dumb sucker, Achan. And the, the, the tragedy is, the tragedy is that God didn't love Achan any less than he loved anybody else. The tragedy is that God didn't have any less a plan for Achan than he had for anybody else. It is a tragedy. It is a tragedy. And it's all based in this thought of that God doesn't know what I'm doing. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Nobody knows what I'm doing. What I'm doing is not going to matter to God. What I'm doing is not going to show up in my life. You know, we ought to know better than this simply because of the internet age. You know, I hope everybody realizes there is no privacy. I just read an article yesterday that for years, for years, for years, the FBI has had the ability to turn your camera on your personal computer without the light coming on and without you knowing it. They've had that ability for years. So in our generation, we ought to understand there's no privacy. All right, don't you think God knows more than the government? So why would we think like Achan that we're going to take an action contrary to the word of God and it not show up in our personal lives? Say it out loud. Faith, Faith. is a matter of sowing and reaping. Sowing. See, if I want a better harvest tomorrow, I've got to change my sowing today. If I want a better tomorrow, whatever better tomorrow is, let's say I want to make more money. One way to make more money for the young people is stay in school. So I have to do something today about what I say I want tomorrow. So we're talking about a vision. And your vision is destiny. And this is not in my notes, and I'm really digressing. But the young people have got a real problem going on in this generation right here. And the young women especially, have got a real problem going on in this generation. In their mind, they see a nice little house and a white picket fence and some kind of a real nice dog, like a, a golden lab or something. And they see a husband. And they see staying home. And they see having a family. They see this they're, they're, because it's their nature to be romantics. But the thought never occurs to them. Well, maybe I'm going to have to stay in school to snag a husband that can provide the house with the picket fence and the golden lab. The thought never occurs to them. Maybe I'm going to have to get my hair done to see this through. The thought never occurs to them. Maybe I'm going to have to take care of myself physically to get to that destination. So it's a problem with this generation especially, and I realize most of you here this morning are older, but I, I want you then to turn around and communicate to the young people 
that your tomorrow is completely dependent on what you do today. And if you want that fabulous tomorrow, well, you're going to have to do something about it today. So to succeed in this life, you, let me say it this way, because I like to use the word must, and I realize not everybody likes that. I would highly recommend that if you want to succeed in life, you follow God's pattern for success. It isn't the way that everyone chooses, but it is a pathway that leads to life in abundance. To succeed, we ought to have a long-term plan, and we ought to have a vision for our own prosperity and success. And I realize that those words are dirty words in 2013. Success is a dirty word. Prosperity is a dirty word. But somebody has to succeed and somebody has to prosper, right? Because if somebody doesn't succeed and somebody doesn't prosper, well, who's going to pay all the taxes for everybody to do nothing? And so we have to succeed and we have to prosper. And everything is going up, up, up. The price of gasoline, the price of health care, everything's going up, up, up. So we have no choice. I don't see that we have any choice but to succeed like we have never succeeded before. Let's say it out loud. In 2014, I'm going to succeed and I'm going to prosper like I never have before. I don't see that we have a choice. So success happens also, and this is why it's frustrating. You know, failure can happen quickly. All you got to do is go rob a bank and failure can happen quickly. But success happens little by little. And success comes little by little <coughs> with the favor of God and the blessing of God upon our lives. Success doesn't come overnight. But success is a product, a byproduct of a life lived for God. When you follow God's plan, you and your children will spend a lifetime enjoying the promises of God in a place that will seem to be a kind of a promised land. Now, I've been rehearsing the story of Bud Sickler and how that he was reluctant to teach the people in Mombasa, Kenya to tithe. And the Lord chastised him and said, don't ever pray and ask me for money while you're robbing my people. And Bud Sickler protested in prayer and said, well, I'm not robbing your people. I'm not taking a goat or a chicken from anyone. And the Lord said, well, you're not teaching them how to walk in financial covenant, my financial covenant of tithing. And Bud, Bud protested. He said, Lord, these are Africans. They, they, they don't, some of them don't have shoes. How can they tithe? And the Lord said, that's it, that's it. You and all of my other servants are killing my people with human mercy. And that's what's happening in this age, in the, the new style evangelicalism that's out there of cheap grace. Because rather than preaching a gospel that sets the captive free, what they're doing is they're actually preaching pop psychology to make people feel better about living a defeated life. I would rather get set free from drugs than feel better about being bound by drugs. <clears throat> I would rather be delivered from alcohol than feel better being bound by alcohol. I would rather come up out of debt and poverty than somebody help me feel better about staying in debt and poverty. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Say it out loud. Whomever the sun sets free sun sets is free indeed. So the message ought to be a message of liberty. And I realize, you know, it's a sleep day, an ice day, and the bulk of the crowd's not here. But I may use this illustration in the coming weeks. It's just fresh this week. I got this from the Lord. If you had the opportunity, I mean, if, if Warren Buffett came to you and said, if you'll give me 10% of everything you make, <clears throat> I will be your advisor. You can run every decision by me. When you prepare a resume, I'll proofread it. When you're getting ready to buy something, I'll advise you. When you're getting ready to sell something, I'll advise you. There's not a person here. Oh, and if you lose money, you owe me nothing. There's not a person here that would not sign up to get that billionaire's Advice and counsel for 10%. If you, could, if you could cut a deal with Donald Trump to where you had his number and you could run every decision by him, every investment decision, when you wrote a resume, he would proofread it. 
There's not a person here. And if you don't make money, you owe me nothing. But if you make money, then I get 10%. Everybody would do it. Everybody would do it. I said everybody would do it. Forget that. If Steve Jobs was still alive. It's so sad. We would have more financial confidence in somebody who probably died lost and without God than we have in God. I mean, think about it. We have a phenomenal opportunity when we walk in financial covenant with God because we can go to him in prayer. And we have made him our partner. And so what happens is when we make him our partner, well, we become his partner. How can we be his partner until we make him our partner? And when I, when, when I give God what God says belongs to him, then he has a vested interest in how well I do. Does that make sense? And so that's what Achan missed out on. Now, we've been reading chapter 7, the first 13 verses, the last couple of weeks. I want to hit the highlights. Verse 1. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. And so they go up against Ai, verse 4. About 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them. Latter part of verse 5. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord remaining there until evening. Verse 7, and Joshua said, Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out your name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, Stand up, what are you doing down on your face? Now, I believe that everything we need to know about why Christians are defeated is right here in Joshua chapter 7. I believe everything we need to know about why Christians are the tail and not the head here in America is right here in Joshua 7. I mean, why is it, why is it, why is it that cruise lines advertise for gays and lesbians, but they don't advertise for Christians? Well, they advertise for who has some money. I mean, why is it that when you log into Netflix and you go to suggestions, there's a category there for gay and lesbians, but there's not a category there for Christians or even for traditional values? Why is that? Well, because we're the tail and we're not the head. And I proclaim on this Ice Sunday, without apology, that God never had a plan for his people to be the tail and not the head. It was always God's plan for his people to be the head and not the tail. But just like Achan could sabotage his own life, just like Achan could sabotage his own family, you, have, you and I have been given the power of free will. There's a, a man that I have befriended in social media, and uh, he and I had a couple of exchanges this week. You know, so when I was 20 years old, I had graduated from college. When I was 20 years old, I was married. When I was 20 years old, I was working on a master's degree. But in 2013, we have young men <clears throat> by the millions across America who are 25, 26, 27, 28, and they sit home and play video games all day. This is not destiny. This is free will. Say it out loud. It's not destiny. It's free will. Now, are you saying everybody should graduate from college when they're 20? No. Are you saying everybody should get married when they're 20? Well, God help you if you do, because this generation is not mature enough to get married when they're 20. I mean, first you got to grow up and get some maturity under your belt before you get married. Well, are you saying that you are more mature, you and Pastor Sue at 20, than young people are today? Well, absolutely. Because this generation is, I don't know. They just don't have the initiative, and I'm not sure why that is. We go round and round about that in staff meetings. Is it the technology? Is it, uh, I don't know. Is it in the water? I don't know. But people are maturing slower than they used to. 
I don't know why that is. But I do know this, that somebody's destiny is not up to God and it's not up to the devil. Somebody's destiny is up to them. And this is something that we teach here at Faith Christian Center, but only you can teach this to your children. I can, t- I can say this on Sunday morning as I am right now, but what good does it do if you don't go home and train your children in this? That if they want to make a good living, they're going to have to stay in school. If they want to, have a, if they want to own a home, they're going to have to save some money. If, if they want to be married to a producer, well, how about this? If you want to be married to a producer, you ought not date unproducers. In other words, if a young woman has a vision for living in a house, maybe she ought not be dating the Xbox master of the universe. (laughs) Maybe she ought to be dating a young man that actually has a J-O-B. Right? Now listen, I can do a good job here on Sunday mornings, but I'm not the one in your home talking to your children. If you don't want to support your son-in-law then these are things you need to teach your daughters. That destiny, say it out loud, destiny Destiny. is not up to God. Destiny Destiny. is not up to the devil. Destiny Destiny. is up to the individual. So we're in charge. And I don't think that's bad news. I think that's good news. Look at verse 11. Israel has sinned. God speaking to Joshua. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Everything you need to know about why Christians turn their backs and run is right here in Joshua 7. Verse uh, 12. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy Whatever among you is devoted to destruction, go consecrate the people. Last phrase of verse 13, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. So how does God, and this is God, man, this is God. What are we going to do about it? You know, God is not a human being, but he is a person. He has a personality. And rather than chafe against his personality, the thing to do is to get to know who he is and conform. He says, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. How many of you want to go to work Monday or Tuesday and God not go with you? Nobody raises their hand. How many of you want to go to school Monday or Tuesday and God not go with you? Nobody raises their hand. How many of you want to go for a job interview this week and God not go with you? Nobody raises their hand. We want God to go with us, but he says, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Listen, if you're new this morning, which may be an unusual situation on a nice Sunday, but maybe you're here and you're new, there's nothing like going to work with the confidence that God is with you. How about going into the delivery room to have a baby? There's nothing like going into the situation knowing that God is with you. Going into the interview knowing that God is with you. Going to the work knowing that God is with you. Applying for a, a, a bachelor's program or a master's program and going to school and putting your hand to it and knowing that God is with you. There's a man here this morning and it wasn't but a few months ago we got laid off. And the company said he wasn't going to get paid on all of his commissions. I'm telling you, man, this is some bad news. You're laid off, and we're not going to pay you for the commissions. And we stood right out there in the fellowship atrium, and we joined hands, and we confessed in Jesus' name, not what we were afraid of, but we confessed what we wanted to see come to pass that he, his position would be restored. And not just that, that he would be paid every commission. And when we stood in faith and held hands and believed God and the words came out of our mouth, it seemed impossible. But the position was restored and every commission has been paid. And not only that, they're looking to promote him to the position of the guy that tried to lay him off. When you go to work with God, it is a completely different situation than going to work 
on your own. Can I get an amen this morning? He says, I'll not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. And then he says, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. See, God wanted all of Israel to participate in his supernatural plan for increase. But rather than have faith for future prosperity, Achan coveted what he saw in the present. Let me run that by again. Rather than have faith for future prosperity, Achan coveted what he saw in the present. See, your present can sabotage your future or your present can build your future. I remember in 1989, I was at 5 a.m. prayer and I thought I was praying. I wasn't praying, I was complaining. And I told the Lord, I said, I'm tired of not ever having any money. And he didn't say FedEx will be here by 10 a.m. and there's going to be a million dollars in the envelope. No, he said, son, you don't ever have any money because you never save any money. Well, I didn't want to hear that. I, I was raised full gospel. I wanted a miracle, right? And he told me, he said, even if it's only $5 a week, every seven days save something. And so I began. I began. I took action on what he said. And then over the years, it adds up. See, God has a wonderful plan for everyone's life. But Achan took what belonged to God and failed to enter into God's covenant. Number one, if you're taking notes, Achan coveted what he saw. He had no vision for God's plan for supernatural increase. Verse 20, Joshua 7, 20, Achan replied, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, <clears throat> the God of Israel. This is what I have done when I saw in the plunder. A beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. So he saw, he coveted, and he took. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with a silver underneath. Say it out loud. If I want God to be faithful to me, I must be faithful to him. Number two, Achan sold out himself and his family for next to nothing, all because he coveted what belonged to God. 200 shekels is about five pounds, and five pounds of silver is about $1,600. 50 shekels is about one and a quarter pounds of gold, which is worth about $25,000. So Achan took the modern equivalent of about $26,000. Verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua together with all Israel took Achan son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? And so Austin last week in his message was talking about how Achan didn't just bring trouble on himself. Achan brought trouble on his wife. Achan didn't just bring trouble on, his, on himself. He brought trouble on his family, his children. But Achan didn't just bring trouble on himself. He brought trouble on the nation of Israel. Verse 25, the Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. Now, I have a gift, and I realize it, and I realize that sometimes it can turn people off. But there's a, a motivational gift operative in my life, and the motivational gift in my life is prophecy. And so... It's easy for me to see. You give me a decision today, and I can tell you how that's going to play out in five years. You tell me you're dating a guy that doesn't have a job. I see it instantly. I see how this is going to turn out in five years. You tell me that you want to quit your job and go to work for your brother-in-law. I, I Instantly, I mean, I can tell you how it's going to turn out. It's a gift. But people seem to have trouble connecting the dots. The average person does not seem to be able to analyze, if I make this decision, how is this going to play out in five years? Or if I make this other decision, how is that going to play out in five years? Now listen, you know who really has trouble with this? is children and young people. I don't remember the name of the part of the brain, but there is a part of the brain that evaluates risk. A part of the brain that where the seat of judgment is located. 
And I don't remember the part, but it's not fully grown. It's not fully matured until about the mid-20s. This is not even fair. Think about how a young person makes the biggest decisions of their lives when they're not really ready to. This is why you see kids do things like go to spring break in Florida and jump off the roof of a hotel to try and make the pool and they miss and they hit the uh, decking because they're not able to fully evaluate risk. Nobody my age is going to jump off the top of a hotel to try and make a pool. Do you understand this? Right? You understand this? So, but when young people are not even ready, they decide whether or not to smoke. Before that part of their brain is even fully developed, they decide whether or not to do drugs. They decide whether or not to engage in premarital sex. They decide whether or not to experiment with homosexuality. It really is almost unfair to young people that some of the biggest decisions they will ever make in their entire lives, they are forced to make before they're even mentally prepared. And that is what parents are for. To guide them. To warn them. To help them. And this is why we're against sex education. I see these wonderful, beautiful children at church in St. Paul's. A child deserves to be left alone and be a child. A child she ought not be confronted with adult stuff. They're going to have their whole lives to deal with adult stuff. A child ought to play with dolls, girls, and, uh, and little trucks, boys, as long as they can. They should be left alone to be children. They're going to have their whole life to deal with adult stuff. Our job as parents is to help them and to guide them, and to warn them, and to train them, because they're going to be called upon to make big decisions before they're even ready. That's part of my job as a pastor, because people come in here, and they've been saved for 20 years, but people come in here, and they've been saved for two weeks, and part of my job is to connect those dots and say that if we don't pray, if we don't read the Bible, we could be messed up in a few months or a few years. If we don't give, we could be messed up in a few months or a few years. If we trust the world with our children, our children could be messed up in a few months or a few years. That's my job. And some people don't like a pastor connecting the dots for them because they want to just willy-nilly blindly go through the snowstorm of life. And then that way, when bad stuff happens, they can say, well, why is the Lord doing this to me like Joshua did? I would rather be prepared. I would rather know the consequences and take action. Number three, God had a plan of supernatural increase for all of Israel, including Achan and his family. And this, to me, is the saddest part of the whole story. But it's just as sad when you think about the, the millions, two, three million Children of Israel came out of Egypt and only two adults made it into the promised land. That was not the plan of God. And you go to Psalm 78 and you find a verse there that a lot of Christians would deny the validity of. David said that they limited God. But your average Christian out here doesn't even think it's possible to limit God. The cheap grace preachers out here would certainly not believe it's possible to limit God. And they blame every bad thing that happens on fate or destiny. A lot of what is being preached in these churches is not Christianity, it is fatalism. Whatever will be, will be. And it it's just as makes as much sense as Doris Day singing it. Whatever will be, will be. It's ludicrous. Whatever will be is what I make it to be. I am not a dog or a cat or a hog or a frog. I have been made in the image of God and God has given me free will. So under him, I'm not saying autonomously, I'm saying under God, I have been given power over my life and so have you. And the good news is, 
we're not operating in the old covenant. So we don't get to stone anybody. We don't want to stone anybody. The good news is we are under the covenant of grace. So no matter what you've done, no matter how you've messed up, no matter what wrong turns you have taken, thanks be unto God. We are not under the law. We are under grace. But that doesn't mean we could just keep right on down the road making the same mistakes we've been making. No, no, no. We repent. We turn from the wrong way. We get back on the right road. As Austin was preaching last Sunday, we go back to the basics. We do what we know to do from the word of God and God in his kindness. God in his grace, God in his mercy will help us get back where we would have been if we had never gotten off the path in the first place. Can you say, thank God, the mercies of God are new every morning. But that does not negate the fact that we have a part to play. So God's plan for supernatural increase is rigged. You have to believe. You have to act on your faith in order to participate. And the sad part is that Achan was a part of God's plan. He and his family ended up dead. And it's worse than that. Do you think God killed them to send them to heaven? No. And God gets blamed for all kinds of stuff that God didn't have a thing in the world to do with. And we do, unfortunately, what Joshua did. Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, why are you doing this? Why did you lead us into this? Why? 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 But we had a part to play. And we want God to fix it and rig it so no matter what we do or don't do or whether we're faithful or unfaithful, we get the same results. But friends, it simply does not work that way. Jesus himself would say to people he had healed, go and sin no more lest something worse come upon you. The woman caught in adultery, he said, go and what? Sin no more. So God has a part to play, but we have a part to play. And I can't do God's part. I can't save my soul from hell. I can't heal my body. I can't do God's part. But wait a minute. God won't do my part. You see this over and over and over in the word of God. That it, at the end of the day, it comes down to individual accountability and individual responsibility. Say it out loud. Obedience to God brings blessings from God. So God wanted all of Israel to participate in his plan. But rather than have faith for future prosperity, Achan coveted what he saw in the present. And our problem is we have trouble evaluating in the present what is going to happen five years hence. That's why it's hard to save money. That's why it's hard, you know, as soon as your car is maybe out of warranty or has uh, some miles on it, it's hard to not go run by another one. It's so easy to buy another one. They make it so easy. It's hard to defer gratification. And that's really what we're preaching. And when the Lord told me in 1989, son, you never have any money because you never save any money, what he was really preaching to me in prayer that day was deferred gratification. That if I want a brighter tomorrow, if I want a better tomorrow, I was going to have to save some money. The same thing is true with giving. I have a part to play. I am going to have to defer some gratification. Now, I know it sounds like bragging, but uh, T.L. Osborne told me that if I really did it, I'm not bragging, I'm reporting. Tell your neighbor, pastor's turned into a reporter. <laughs> God help us. So when I was 20... And I bought that health insurance policy for us. You know what else? Sue and I were tithers. We had next to nothing. We earned next to nothing. I was in school full-time, worked part-time. She was in school part-time, worked full-time. But we tithed. Think about it. We had next to nothing. We were students. We were living in an $84 a month seminary duplex apartment. But we tithed. 
And I remember some of those young guys that I went to school with, they were prophets of poverty. They didn't believe in success. They didn't believe in prosperity. And so today, think about it. Today, they could come and visit, not on a nice day, but some other day. They could come and see the crowds. They could come and see the property, the assets. They could come and see Gene and Sue and judge us. But I'd like to go back to 1976 and see whether they were tithing or not. 77, 78, 79, 80, and march down through the years and see how, what kind of percentage of their income were they giving. We're talking about deferred gratification. My grandfather was a farmer. I was a city boy, but twice a year I got to go and spend time with him and, and watch how they did. He had 188 acres. It's an amazing thing. He didn't expect to harvest 500 acres. He had 188 acres. That's all they could plant. That's all they could harvest. On occasion, they might lease a field, a farm from somebody else, but that's what gave him the right to expect more. You cannot reap more unless you have sown more. And even if, you lay, even if you lease the neighbor's farm down the road, he, he'd have to go down there and plow it. He'd have to go down there and sow it. And then he'd have to go down there and harvest it. So this whole concept of something for nothing, I think, is a city concept. People who grew up on farms, people who are acquainted with the way the earth works, don't expect something for nothing. They realize you got to put something in. And here's the worst part of it. You have to put something in to get something out. You know, I have not lifted a finger on my education for 29 years. But for 29 years, everywhere I go, I can go to a bank, I can go into a car dealership, everywhere I go, people greet me, as Dr. Lingerfeld, 29 years. Now, just Saturday night, I had the same dream I have about once a month, that I have class tomorrow and I didn't do the work. <laughs> I'll have to die and go to heaven to get past the dream. But I'm just saying, I have not lifted a finger for 29 years on that. But I'm reaping, reaping, Reaping. And then compensation is out of our hands in churches. We have to have an outside service. We have to have an outside uh, evaluation based on what ministers are making nationwide. This is the law. It's out of our hands. And so I get compared to what? High school graduates? No, I get compared to guys who are Southern Baptists mainly who have the doctorates, well, thank God, they do well. Amen. Amen. Every year, I'm reaping, reaping, reaping. If you go out here and you get an RN degree, you'll spend the rest of your life reaping, reaping. You, you get to be a, a, a doctor of veterinary medicine. You become a dentist, whatever it is. You put that time in, even a master's degree. We have a lady in our church here, and she works in a public school, but she's got a lot of years of service. She is bilingual certified, and she's got a master's degree. Reaping, reaping, reaping every year, every year, every year, every year. And that's the way walking with God is. We sow, and we sow, and we sow, and we sow, and it's a cycle. It's a cycle of life. It's a cycle of economic life. And then it begins to take on a power of its own. It begins to take on an energy of its own. And it's almost like canoeing. And you're, you're in the calm water and you're rowing and you're rowing and it's work, but then all of a sudden you get to that part of the river where it's moving and you're not working. Now you're just steering. 
because the river's carrying you. And that's the way the prosperity and the blessing of Almighty God is. It's like a river. And listen, while I'm on that topic of river, when it comes to our success and prosperity, too many people have a picture because our message this morning is vision is destiny. Too many people have a picture of success and prosperity and money being a reservoir. As Christian people, it was never meant to be a reservoir. Success and money and prosperity was meant to be a river. And so it flows through. And as it flows through, we're blessed, but we're a blessing. But as it flows through, we get to live on the flow. So we're not hoarders. Christian people are not hoarders. Now I want to end the series this morning where we began. Let's go back to chapter 1. And I want to rehearse as we conclude the seven steps to prosperity and success that God himself gave to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. So number one, write it down. Be strong and courageous. Tell your neighbor, be strong and courageous. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. So number two, be careful to obey. And number three, do not turn to the right or to the left. And the promise is that you may be successful wherever you go. Verse 8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So number four, do not let the word depart from your mouth. And let me say something uh, kind of as a personal note. In the last few years, and I would say this pertains more to the church than to us personally, but in the last few years, I have seen God answer us in some phenomenal ways that frankly, I don't think I had faith for. And on these occasions in the last few years where I saw God do some amazing supernatural works on our behalf that I really don't know that I had faith for, we confessed our way through them. We said what we wanted not what we dreaded. We said what we desired, not what we feared. And I have been reminded probably a thousand times in the last few years, something Kenneth Hagin used to teach, that faith will work in your heart when there's doubt in your head. Praise God that I went to hear that old man of faith teach the word of God and not some new thing that didn't work. Amen. Say it out loud. Faith will work in my heart even when there's doubt in my head. So God says to Joshua, number four, do not let the word depart from your mouth. Number five, meditate on the word day and night. And then he also says out of verse eight, number six, do everything the word tells you to do. And what's the promise? Then you will be prosperous and successful. And let me ask you a question. Why would God give Joshua a formula to be prosperous and successful if it were not the will of God for Joshua to be prosperous and successful? And why would God see to it by the Holy Spirit that that formula was preserved for thousands of years for you and I to read this morning if it were not the will of God for us to be prosperous and successful? Say it out loud. It is the will of God that I be prosperous. It is the will of God that I be successful. Verse 9, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Number 7, do not be terrified and do not be discouraged. And the promise is the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And we saw how that played out in chapter 7 when the Lord said, I won't go with you as long as you have the devoted things among you. So our goal 
If you're in school, if you're dating, oh my God, I am so glad, so glad, so glad I'm married. I cannot imagine dating today. Oh my God. And oh my God, I, we went and we had lunch with some of these, or dinner with some of these uh, college girls this past week up in Springfield, Missouri. I got in the car and I told Sue, I said, I pray for them every day. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Because you picked the wrong guy. Oh my God, you have to pick him up and carry him through life. Oh my God. I mean, is he going to be a wage earner or an ex-boxer? Oh my God. But to live life. So you're dating. That God be with you. That you have his wisdom. That you have his knowledge. If you get engaged, you know, as long as you're engaged, you can still throw him overboard. (laughs) Amen. I said, amen. Amen. I told my daughter, I said, you know, you want to throw this dude over? I said, I'll eat all the expenses. I'll cover all the expenses. I said, you got you to know in your heart, this is it. When you pull that trigger. If you're engaged to have, the, to have God go with you, to have the mind of Christ, to have the wisdom of God. When you, when you write that resume, when you go for that interview, when you apply for a job at everything in life. It seems to me, as your pastor, the objective of success and prosperity is whatever I do for God to go with me. If God goes with me, I've got to do better with God than without God. Can you say amen? Well, I'm out of time. I hope you enjoyed the message this morning.